good? Can you hear me? Okay. So to begin with, what is a path? Well, for today, I mostly am going to mean a continuous map from either 0, 1 or 0, infinity to the complex plane C union infinity. And um, in many cases, we'll be interested only in paths modulo monotone reparametrization. Um, uh, what is a random path? OK, well, that's a little bit more of an interesting question. But there's an obvious, yes, association? There's an obvious candidate, which is Brownian motion. So it's the most natural notion of a canonical random path. Um, I'll draw you one here. Here's a Brownian motion in the plane. Okay, that's if you and if you pay close attention, you'll notice that uh, my increments were stationary. There was a Markov property, you know, condition on what I had done to some point. What happened after that was independent. There was rotational invariance, um, also conformal invariance, um, which may have been harder to get from one sample. But you know that if I take a conformal map, let's say I run this Brownian motion until it exits this domain. I take a conformal map to another domain, and I look at this Brownian motion here, run till it first exits. Yes? OK. All right. Thick. OK. So this is a, a no, I don't know if it's much better. Um, OK. We're going to have a good path here. Oh, well. Mm. I don't know. These paths are all a little disappointing. But anyhow, um, what you see uh, is that the law of the, the image of this path over here is just a Brownian motion on this side. So Brownian motion is invariant under conformal maps. And um, uh, up, to, uh, you know, up to a time change. And, um, and in many ways, you know, Brownian motion is sort of uniquely characterized by these various symmetries. You know, you can take, I mean, various subsets of this list of symmetries will, will uniquely characterize Brownian motion. So you can think of it as saying Brownian motion is the unique path that has all these properties. Um, and it's also, everyone knows a fine lattice limit of discrete random walks. If I take a very uh, fine grid and do a simple random walk on that, it's going to look like Brownian motion in the limit. Now, what is a, a non-self-crossing path? Um, well, that is a, a path that doesn't cross itself. Um, if you like, a path that you can obtain is a uniform limit of simple paths. So um, you know, something like this, a path that comes and bounces off of itself, I'll consider non-self-crossing. Um, but something, you know, this is, it clearly crosses itself, right? So that's uh, a non-self-crossing path. And now what is a, a random non-self-crossing path? What's the natural probability measure on paths that don't cross themselves? And um, well, OK, so Bill and discuss. there's already one, one path you can get, which is just to take the Take the outer boundary of this Brownian path here. This outer boundary is now a path that doesn't cross itself. So just using Brownian motion, I have now made a, a random non-self-crossing path. And um, you know, this path was already you know, studied by Mandelbrot who conjectured that the Hausdorff dimension of this path would be 4 thirds. A um, number of things, you know, Mandelbrot, he started talking about fractals already in the 60s. And you know, by the 80s, everyone was talking about Mandelbrot's fractals. And he was talking about things like, like this. This is supposed to be something like the coastline of Britain or something, right? He had all these stories about how these self-similarity patterns arise in our world. And, um, and this conjecture that this dimension is 4 thirds was finally uh, established by, um, by uh, Vendelin um, and uh, along with uh, Odette Schramm and, and, and Greg Lawler. And, uh, and doing so, this, you know, this was part of Vendelin's uh, Fields Metal work, right? I guess I can say that. 
this was a um, uh, you know really understanding um, what what this what kind kind of path this is. It turns out it's one of these SLE paths, um, Charles Movner evolution, and uh, they were really able to understand this on a much deeper level. Um, okay, so what's a surface? Well, okay, this is a this is a geometry conference mostly. I guess guess you know what that is, but for me, I say it's a two-dimensional manifold, and today maybe you, you can let it be simply connected with boundaries. So, um, what's a random surface? Okay, well we'll have to think about that one. Um, what's an imaginary surface? Well. Okay, I, I, I have a certain notion in mind for what I mean by imaginary surface. Um, I don't know if you all will like this, but uh, you know, a real surface, you have a, a kind of a canonical notion of, well, you have a metric on it. If I give you a Riemannian surface, right? So if I parallel transport around some, some region, then the, the size, my size when I come back to where I started is the same as it was before. I have kind of a universal notion of size. And you can imagine that, well, what if you had a complex structure where instead of having a universal notion of scaling, you had a universal orientation. Um, and so as you parallel transport around, you know, you still multiply by e to the i times the curvature. That's, I mean, if, it, if I'm on a real domain, I go around, then I rotate the tangents, I multiply the tangent space by e to the i times curvature. That's a rotation. Um, and... Uh, and imagine if, if the curvature were imaginary, then when you parallel transport it around, you would just be have a dilation. No. Okay. Anyhow, it, it's some fairly simple notion of uh, a complex structure with a connection where the um, you preserve orientation when you go around a loop instead of preserving size. Okay. And imaginary random surface. Well, we'll have to think about that. Starting to think about that. You know, I'm going to propose SLE is kind of the natural thing here. Random surface, there's something called Louisville quantum gravity that I'll discuss that seems to be kind of a canonical notion of a random surface in the same way it, that this is a random non-self-crossing path and that this is a random path. Um, uh, and I hope I can convince you of what a, a random imaginary surface is. It should be some sort of a Louisville quantum gravity with an extra I thrown in somewhere. And uh, we'll, we'll see how that works. OK, so these are the eight questions. And this is my goal. Is really, I, I think I've answered four of them. So it's just these, these four that I really have to get to by the end of the talk. OK, so, um, so non-self-crossing path. So if I'm given a, a simply connected planar domain D with boundary points A and B and a parameter kappa, then this schramm lovner evolution which we don't know, SLE kappa is a random non-self-crossing path in the closure of, of the domain from A to B. So it's just some random fractally looking curve from A to B. And the parameter kappa indicates roughly how windy the path is. Small kappa is more or less a, smoo is a smooth path, r relatively smooth, and large kappa is much more windy. And uh, we'd like to argue that these SLEs are in some sense the canonical uh, random non-self-crossing path. And well, what symmetries characterize SLE? Well, turns out first we have conformal invariance just like we had in this picture here. Okay, so if you, um, you, know, if you haven't seen this before, this is uh, maybe the most important thing to, to get from this talk, is that um, this curve satisfies this symmetry that uh, if I take a map phi from one domain D to another domain, then um, the image of this path will be an SLE in this new domain. So I haven't really defined SLE yet, but I, I've given you a symmetry it has to satisfy. If I define it in one domain, I have a definition in any other domain because I can just apply a conformal map. And this tells you what it is in the other domain. OK. Um, so one domain with a pair of boundary points. Um, also, there's a Markov property which says that if I condition on eta up to some stopping time t, so maybe I, I run the path until the first time it exits some ball, 
around A or something like that. I run the path up till some stopping time. Conditioned on that time, the conditional law of the remainder of the path should just be, an, be that of an SLE in the original domain minus the path you've seen so far. So this new domain I get by cutting this path out from this tip to B. OK, and now you can see this is sort of imposing some restrictions on the kinds of paths we can have, because it says that you know, if I look at the law of the original path, you know, that's some law. And now if I run this to a stopping time, the law of this remainder of the path is the same as the law of the original path conformally mapped to the complement of the part I've seen so far. Okay, So in some sense, if I just knew how to draw a little bit of the path, then you know, by I knew how to draw, say, the first little bit, then I could draw that over here, then draw an independent copy of the first little bit, conformally map it over here to draw another piece here, draw another independent first bit, conformally map it to draw a next piece. So really, somehow, um, these properties determine the law of the path once I know just how to draw a little bit of it. And uh, in fact, what Schrom proved is they actually tell you everything about the law of the path up to the single parameter kappa. Um, so conformal variance in this marker property completely determine the law of SLE up to this parameter, up to this parameter. And he gave a fairly explicit way of describing the path. He said an SLE from zero to infinity in the complex upper half plane can be defined in a rather interesting way. Given a path gamma, you can construct conformal maps G sub T from the complement, the half plane minus gamma from zero to T to the half plane. So you you have your half plane, you've started drawing this path, and I take a conformal map from the complement of the path so far back to just the half plane. And, um, and in order to fix this map, I can normalize so it looks like the identity near infinity. So the limit as z goes to infinity of g sub t of z minus z is 0. And um, so these maps, g sub t, so they're conformal maps for the complement of the path up till time t back to uh, the half plane. Um, what he shows is that this family of maps, well, we know it evolves as t evolves. And he shows that if you take any fixed z, then this g sub t of z will satisfy an ODE. And it's this um, the time derivative of g sub t of z is 2 over g sub t of z minus w t. And this he takes to be a multiple of a Brownian motion. So it's root kappa times Brownian motion, which is the same in law as Brownian motion run kappa times as fast as normal. Okay, so in some sense, the, the left-right fluctuations of WT encode the way this path veers to the left and veers to the right, where veers to the left kind of means in a conformal sense. When I conformally map back, that little piece uh, is veering a little bit leftward. And so somehow, you know, I think of WT as being sort of a conformal steering wheel. It's as WT goes up and down, this path veers left and veers right. And, um, and so basically, it takes this Brownian motion and using this Lovner's equation converts it into a random curve. OK. Um, and Roden Schramm proved that this random curve you get, if cap is equal or less than 4, it's a random curve that doesn't hit itself. If it's between 4 and 8, it, it bounces off of itself, but still doesn't cross itself. And when kappa is equal or greater than 8, it's actually so windy that it's actually a space-filling curve. It hits every point in the plane. It's still a non-self-crossing curve in the sense I, I described before, but it, um, but it fills space. OK. Um, well another thing that uh, uh, Benelin mentioned in his talk is there's a model called percolation, which says I take a you know a honeycomb lattice like this and I toss a coin for each hexagon to decide its color. Here I've you know done the same thing with the dual lattice, so an uh, uh, independent coin for each vertex. Um, 
except that on the boundary, I'm going to fix it to be all black on one side and all white on the other side of the boundary. So it's all black here, all white here. Inside, I toss coins. And then what you see is there's a natural curve that starts at the top, comes around here, and ends here. And, um, and so I guess part of uh, Stas Smirnov's Fields Medal was, was understanding these random curves and actually showing that if you take a, a very fine uh, grid of hexagons and you draw this path, that it, it looks like an SLE 6. Um, so SLE with that particular parameter 6 for kappa. And so that's, it's, it's a path that hits itself, but it's not a space-filling path. And you know, actually proving uh, these conformal symmetries. OK, so, so now let's revisit this what is a surface question. So I think we did the what is a path fairly well. Um, OK, so everyone can, can wake up once again. New topic. Uh, OK, what is a surface? So again, you know, this is a crowd of geometers. You know, you deal with much more sophisticated things than two-dimensional manifolds. But you know, just think back to that very first thing you learned on the very first day of graduate school. Um, you know, there's this uniformization result that says every smooth, simply connected Riemannian manifold M can be conformally mapped back to either the unit disk D or the complex plane C or you know, the complex sphere, C union infinity. And uh, another way to think of that is, you know, you have isothermal coordinates. Uh, M, your manifold, can be parametrized by points Z equals X plus IY, where these points live in one of these spaces um, in such a way that the metric takes the form E to the lambda Z, well, some positive function, which I can write as E to the lambda Z, by lambda is just its log. Um, times dx squared plus dy squared, so some real valued function uh, lambda. And so then the x, y are called isothermal coordinates or isothermal parameters uh, for m. Okay, and then I'll write d for the parameter space, and uh, which I said it can be, you know, a complex plane or a disk, and I'll say, well, just let it be some simply connected bounded subdomain of C which is always conformally equivalent to the disk by Riemann mapping theorem. So, um, and so again, to maybe write this on the board, I don't know what marker works, but here we, you know, you have some crazy wild manifold M, and you're going to map it to something nice and simple, like a disk with a conformal map. And when you pull back the metric up here, you get some with the conformal map, you get a kind of nice metric down here, which is just a, it's going to be e to this lambda of z times, you know, the Euclidean metric, dx squared plus y squared. Um, or if you wanted to look at the measure, you could say, you know, take e to the lambda z dz and let this be Lebesgue measure. Okay, but, um, you're basically pulling, taking the structure up here and pulling it back to give a structure here. And the point is, everything is determined by just this one parameter function. So you might think a surface is a very wild object. Maybe you don't even know how to embed it in a finite dimensional space. It's something crazy. You know, it's a manifold. But I can always conformally map it to something nice. And then the entire surface is determined by this one parameter, this real valued function on the disk. And if I want to know the length of a path in M, I just integrate this e to the lambda s over 2 ds, the area. I just integrate e to the lambda z dz, where dz is the big measure. Um, if I want to know the Gaussian curvature of d, that's minus the Laplacian of lambda. That gives you the density of curvature. I mean, if I want to, uh, the phase of measurable subset, the integral of the Gaussian curvature uh, over a is just the integral over A of minus Laplacian lambda of Z. So remember, you, you parallel transport around a region A. How much does 
you, know, you, you have a small bug, you parallel transport around a region A, the bug gets rotated by some amount, which is the integral of the Laplacian of, of lambda of z. In particular, if lambda is harmonic, then the bug doesn't get rotated at all. This is a flat, flat metric. OK. Um, here are pictures. For those who haven't seen these, uh, David Jiafeng Gu has this wonderful web page with, with a whole um, bunch of very beautiful pictures uh, of conformal maps from famous works of art, Michelangelo's David, other great classics of, of Greek sculpture, to classics of Greek mathematics, like spheres and, and disks. And, um, you know, and you can see, you know, angles are preserved. You know, take a little angle here. It, it looks the same up here. But, you know, parts are stretched and, and distorted. <laughs> well, that's right. So you, you have some conformal maps, right, of symmetries. I think he, he chooses one that uh, looks nice. Right, as, as for aesthetic reasons. He's an artist as well as a mathematician. I mean, he chooses them to look, to look beautiful. And, um, well, <laughs> I, I think it's beautiful anyway. Um, I mean, like you say, he, he could have done a map that mapped the entire nose to this big region and had the rest all scrunched up in back, right? So I, I think he made a, a good choice, all things considered. Um, okay, but, but the point is, you know, if, if I take you know, say this face, I could formally map it to a disk. I could think of it as being the disk is a, a parameter space for this. And then I can think of the, um, just this function lambda on the disk as somehow describing this entire manifold up here. Even though, um, obviously, I mean, maybe not the embedding in, in R3, but, but the in intrinsic structure of the manifold is all encoded by this one function lambda. Okay, so just as with this, Loebner revolution gave us this magic way of using this function wt to encode this crazy curve. Um, so wt was just a one parameter function, but it encoded this two parameter, you know, this hump, this path in the plane. You know, here you have this single function here that encodes this whole crazy structure. So now by Riemann uniformization, I can define SLE on any simply convected Riemannian surface with boundary. Um, so if I want to do an SLE on this guy, say from his chin up to his ear, I just conformally map some the face back to a disk, define SLE in the disk from one point to the other, and then lift it back up here. So I can define random SLE curves. All those loop ensembles Vendelin was drawing, you know, in the last talk, you can put them all on um, on any surface you want. Okay, so. So Riemann uniformization lets us reduce the problem of defining a random manifold to the problem of just defining a random function from a planar domain to the real numbers. And what is the most natural random generalized function from a planar domain to R that you can think of? Well, I would like to propose it's the Gaussian free field. That's sort of the two-dimensional analog of a Brownian motion, meaning a two-dimensional time, a random function from uh, R2 to R. Now first I'll give you a discrete version of it. Let f and g be real valued functions defined on the vertices of a planar graph. Um, then I can define a Dirichlet inner product of f and g by just the sum, basically the dot product of their discrete gradients. The sum over all pairs of edges of the change in f times the change in g. And then the value, h of f, which is just the uh, sort of the inner product of f with itself, that's just the sum of the height differences squared over all edges. For every edge, I look, how much did it, the height change from one side of that edge to the other? Square that. And um, so the sum of these squares differences I call a Dirichlet energy. And, um, and now if I fix some boundary value, I fix something on the boundary values of lambda. Let me draw a lambda for you here. Here's a graph lambda, and I, I fix some values on the, maybe on the boundary of the grid. And then you can re-randomize the, the values inside in some way. Um, so the set of functions that have these given boundary values is, is some finite dimensional vector space. And the gas free field says choose from this finite dimensional vector space uh, in such a way that the probability density is e to the minus this energy. 
Okay, and this energy is a quadratic function, and e to the minus one of these quadratic positive definite functions. You know, this this is going to be a um, a Gaussian, a certain uh, multivariate Gaussian random variable, um, and so it's random element of the space probability density e to the minus h of f over two. Okay, the um, here's a picture of this on a twenty by twenty grid graded with Mathematica, and you see, um, you know, it's roughly kind of a continuous function. You don't have large jumps because, you know, this h of f will be small if f is constant, right? Then this is zero. If f winds up and down a lot, then the sum of the square differences will be large. So basically, you penalize functions that have a lot of fluctuation um, in favor of functions that are smooth. And, um, and we're taking e to the h of f, which means, you know, if I had one place here where there was a jump of size 20 from one neighbor to another, that would um, add a, a 20 squared, a 400, to the, um, uh, to the energy function h. And then that would multiply this probability by e to the minus 400. So, so jumps of size 400 turn out to be incredibly unlikely. You know, I could have a picture the size of the universe. You wouldn't see any jumps of size 20. Um, anywhere in in that grid. So in some sense, it's a rather continuous function, which all practical purposes bounded increments. Um, now there's a continuum version of this, which is what you get if you take this thing on a very fine lattice and take the limit as the lattice gets smaller. And that's, if you like, a standard Gaussian on an infinite dimensional Hilbert space. So given a planar domain D, let HD be the Hilbert space closure of the set of smooth, compactly supported functions on D under this Dirichlet inner product, which is uh, basically inner product of f1 and f2 is the integral of the dot product of their gradients. And, um, and the, the energy will just be the L2 norm of a gradient. So the inner product of a vector of a function with itself is just the L2 norm of its gradient. And, um, well, squared. And so the gas free field will then be a formal sum. H is the sum alpha i, f i, where fi are an orthonormal basis for h, and the alpha i are iid Gaussian random variables. Okay. Now, so if you like, this is just an infinite dimensional Hilbert space with this a particular inner product on it. And I'm saying, choose a standard Gaussian in this infinite dimensional Hilbert space. Meaning, you know, take an orthonormal basis and in each each coordinate is going to be an independent variance one Gaussian random variable. Okay, but but the standard Gaussian in infinite dimensional Hilbert space, as you may know, does not live in the Hilbert space itself, right? Because if I take an infinite series of IID random variables and I ask what's the norm of this vector I get, you know, if these are the coordinates, the coordinates are IID Gaussians, then the norm is the sum of the squares. But if I take the sum of the squares of these independent normal random variables, that will be infinite with probability 1. So in some sense, I have this nice Hilbert space. I want to take a Gaussian random variable in the Hilbert space, where the probability is just e to the minus the Hilbert space norm. But I find that I get a sum that does not converge within the Hilbert space itself. OK, but so what? The sum converges uh, within another space, a bigger space. And it turns out that. Um, even though this doesn't converge within the space of L2 functions, it does converge within the space of, of distributions. So this is going to give you a random generalized function. And this is, by the way, just the analog of the way in one dimension you would um, construct white noise or Brownian motion um, uh, in, in a similar fashion. So this is basically uh, you know, Wiener chaos in uh, higher dimensions. OK. So um, now some properties of this uh, discrete free field. Um, you know, if I have zero boundary conditions, then this Dirichlet form is the actual inner product, and the, the discrete Gaussian field is the standard Gaussian on this space. If I take an other boundary condition, so I put some f naught on the boundary, then the discrete Gaussian field will be the same as the zero boundary version, except that I add a deterministic function, namely the discrete harmonic interpolation of f naught to lambda. So if I give you zero boundary conditions, I get some random function. 
if I gave you some other boundary conditions, I'd get the same random function plus the discrete harmonic interpolation. Right? Discrete harmonic means the value of every vertex is the average of the values at its neighbors. And there's, given the values on the boundary, there's a unique way to interpolate to a discrete harmonic function in the interior. OK, and there's also a sort of Markov property that says, if I condition on the values of f on the boundary of some subgraph of the domain, then the values of f on the remainder have the law of the discrete Gaussian free field um, on this lambda prime with boundary condition uh, given by the observed values on the boundary. So if I tell you I condition on the values outside of this set, then the conditional law inside the set is still a Gaussian free field with boundary con conditions given by the observed values. Okay. And so now I can do a solve a problem like this where instead of percolation, I use the Gaussian free field. And how do I mean that? Well, let's say on all these black vertices, I set the boundary value for my Gaussian field to be some negative constant, say negative lambda. And here, I'll make it some positive constant. Say positive, say call it lambda, not to be confused with this lambda. And, and, then I, um, and then I choose these inside guys according to the Gaussian free field, but I'll color them black if the value is negative and white if the value is positive. Okay, this gives me a different way of producing a coloring of these hexagons, but now there's some dependence, right? If the value is, if this hexagon is white, it makes it slightly more likely that its neighbors will be white as well. So there's some correlation. It's a more complicated structure than just independent percolation. Um, but nonetheless, what we find is that that path, this interface here, if you take a very fine lattice, it converges to a, um, uh, a path which is an SLE4. This is joint work with Odette Schramm. If you take these particular boundary values, minus lambda, lambda where it's this particular constant, then the scaling limit will be SLE4. And if you use some other constant for the boundary values, then you get a certain variant of SLE4. Um, OK. Um, so here's an actual picture of this. I've set the boundary values to be minus lambda here, plus lambda here. Inside, I use the Gaussian free field. And the coloring um, just indicates the height. So white values, it's a high value. Um, things that are shaded dark, it's a low value of the field. And then I take this path, which, which separates things that are where the height's positive from where they're negative. And in the fine mesh limit, this, uh, this path will be an SLE4. And if you think about it, it's kind of natural to interpret this path as a, a zero level set of the curve. So here, for example, if I were to take this path and linearly interpolate to a function on triangles, then on each triangle that has, say, two white vertices on one black, it's negative here, positive here, positive here. So that means it's zero somewhere on this edge, zero somewhere on this edge. Well, in fact, it's zero on the whole line segment between those if it's linear on this triangle. And so if I take the piecewise linear interpolation, this zero level set will precisely go through those edges that are duals of the edges of this path down here. So this really is, in some sense, the, the zero level set of the Gaussian free field. And you can actually take the fine mesh limit and make sense of a, a zero level set of the continuum Gaussian free field, which is a little weird if you think about it. I mean, the Gaussian free field is the most natural random function from R2 to R, kind of a canonical random function. But it's not quite a function. It's a distribution. Nonetheless, it has level sets. And these level sets are the most natural random non-self-crossing paths. They are these SLE curves. OK. So and you, know, and you have to make sense of that in various ways. You, know, you can take your free field and approximate it by you know, projecting it onto a space of piecewise linear functions, take a limit. Um, you know, the various ways to make sense of this, uh, this statement that this, this Gaussian free field, which is only a distribution, nonetheless has well-defined level sets. OK. And here, um, here are pictures of, uh, here's the, the function plot of this curve. So viewed as a function, you can see it's 
minus a constant on this boundary plus a constant on this boundary. Um, here, this is the conditional expectation given the values on the boundary. And you see that you know, the, the values are kind of negative along this side of the boundary. They're positive along this side of the boundary. But if I condition on the values along this path and then take the discrete harmonic extension, that will tell me the conditional expectation of the field given just the values I saw when I explored the path. And what you find is that this discrete harmonic extension is roughly one constant on this side, another constant on this side. So basically these values, you know, viewed in this curve, you see I have all sorts of wild fluctuations among the negative numbers on the left side, the positive numbers on the right side. But when I get a few lattice spacings away and take the harmonic extension, all these fluctuations kind of average out. And it really starts to look like just one constant on the left side, another constant on the right side. Okay, and this um, observation is actually the key to, to proving that this path converges to SLE4. You really start by showing that in the, in the scaling limit, um, you do get a random curve where the conditional expectation on, if I draw a piece of the curve, the conditional expectation of the field is kind of one constant on the left side, another constant on the right. So these level sets, they're kind of like little level cliffs. In level sets, there's a little height gap between one side and the other, and the height gap is still there in the limit. When I take finer meshes, I rescale the mesh size, but I don't rescale vertically, oddly enough. It's not like the Brownian motion construction in that way. So, so I, I don't rescale vertically. So I really, in the scaling limit, I do have a level set that has this distinct height gap, that, that it stays there. Here's, um, if I take other boundary conditions, say plus or minus three lambda, I find that even though the boundary conditions are different, nonetheless the height gap is still the same. It's still minus lambda this side, plus lambda this side. So the height gap is somehow something intrinsic to the interior. It doesn't depend on what nonsense you've done on the boundary. Um, and here you can see what that looks like. So the, the conditional expectation will be basically a harmonic function that slopes from minus lambda over here on average, minus three lambda here, plus lambda here, plus three lambda here. Okay, and understanding these conditional expectations, again, is key to, to making the whole story work. Here are all the zero contour lines starting at the boundary. You get these kind of beautiful fractal pictures that, and you know, as Vendelin said, if you actually, you know, if you iterate this process, you can actually get a, a, a set of loops that are these, these conformal loop ensembles that, that, uh, that Vendelin was, was discussing. So, so this all comes from just level sets of this Gaussian free field. Okay, and so these, these are some references for, for that. Um, so this is our, our long paper, which was some 130 pages that really kind of uh, explains all of that business with the, the height gap. And basically the hard part of this paper is showing that that height gap between the two sides is what I said it was. You know, minus lambda one side, plus lambda on the other side in the limit. Okay, so now what is a random surface? All right, so here's one way of making a random surface. Okay. For everyone who's been asleep, another time to wake up. I have to wake people up periodically. Um, all right, so here's one way to make a random surface. Take a bunch of unit squares and just glue them together along their boundaries. Um, so, you know, I take a bunch of squares. Let's say I want you to make a quilt. I say take these squares and just stitch them together along their boundaries in some way that you make a, a, a quilt out of gluing squares. And if, if you're very boring and pedestrian, you might make a quilt that, that looks something like this grid here. But you know, if you're even mildly more creative, you might um, have places where you have uh, maybe three squares coming together at a point instead of four. Or maybe five squares coming together at a single point. Um, you know, we sometimes call this the, 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 the drunk quilt maker model. You know, you're, you're, you're making a, a quilt out of sewing these squares together and assume you're drunk enough that the quilt is random but not so drunk that it fails to be simply connected. So suppose you know, you, we produce this quilt and let's say at the end of the day we stitch it all up so it makes a surface that's like a sphere. Then um, 
you can imagine that uh, you know, there are finitely many ways to do that, to identify the edges of this finite collection of squares to make a sphere. And you could say, just choose one of these ways of doing this uniformly at random. And that already gives you a, a random surface built out of unit squares. Okay, and then it's, it's a manifold with just these little conical singularities at points where um, you have, you know, you're gluing together um, a number of squares that's not uh, four out of point. Okay, and these are related to uh, random planar maps, random matrix models. Um, you know, there are ways of enumerating these using random matrices. <coughs> but I want to talk about a continuum approach. So, a continuum approach, as described above, we use conformal maps to reduce the problem of making this random uh, manifold to making this random function on um, the planar domain. And we use a multiple of the Gaussian free field for the random function. And if you use the Gaussian free field, then you get at least you know, the critical version of what they call Liouville quantum gravity. Okay, this um, goes back to Polyakov, uh, late 70s, early 80s. I like to show this quote because it, 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 it's fairly grand in laying out his vision of uh, what he intends uh, this subject to accomplish. He says, there are methods and formula in science which serve as master keys to many apparently different problems. The resources of such things have to be refilled from time to time. In my opinion, at the present time, we have to develop an art of handling sums over random surfaces. These sums replace the old-fashioned and extremely useful sums over random paths. The replacement is necessary because today gauge invariance plays a central role in physics. Elementary excitations and gauge theories are formed by the flux lines closed in the absence of charges, and the time development of these lines forms the world surfaces. All transition amplitudes are given by the sums over all possible surfaces with fixed boundary. So basically, he wanted to have a version of Feynman path integrals that would work for strings. And this is kind of part of the birth of, of string theory as we know it today, that instead of taking a, a, a point and integrating over all paths it can travel, take a string and integrate over all paths possible paths the string can take. But a string in time, it traces out a two-dimensional surface in four-dimensional space-time called the, the world sheet uh, of the string. And he wants to kind of integrate over all possible string shapes. And at the beginning, as you see in 81, he's not talking about you know, grand unified theory of everything. He's just talking about understanding gauge theories better. Um, but eventually, this, this sort of evolved into the kind of the, the more ambitious um, project that, that we know of as, as string theory. And, um, but his idea was, you know, let's start by just trying to understand this world sheet as a random manifold and try to put some sort of a, a structure on it and um, think about what kind of a geometric structure it would have. And, um, and that's how he came up with Sluvo quantum gravity. Um, so, again, here's a discrete picture of, I take these squares and glue them together um, in some random fashion. And what I want to point out is that after you've glued all these squares together to make this random manifold, you can put additional structure on this. For example, suppose I toss a coin for each square to decide whether to draw in the diagonal from red to red or draw in the diagonal from green to green. Then what I find is, I get a picture like this with some red subgraph and some dual green subgraph sitting there. And, or maybe I could insist that the red graph be a tree and the green graph be a dual tree or something. And either way, I get this additional structure on top of the map. And if I were to conformally map this thing to a disk, say I take this map, or maybe I conformally map it to the half plane, then this additional structure, these paths, or maybe the interfaces, their boundaries would be kind of loops. These are all going to get mapped to some sort of structure over here. I'll get trees or paths or loops over on this side. And there's an ansatz that says that the images of these paths here, over here, should look like SLE curves over here. Okay, And that hasn't, hasn't been completely proved yet. But we believe that when you can formally map this to here, what you'll get is the metric structure of this should be a look like a Louisville quantum gravity surface. And the, um, somehow the curves should look like SLE curves. 
put on top of the Louisville quantum gravity surface. Okay, and so that's a project. You know, we have we have bits, pieces of it we can do, forms of it we can do, forms that are in progress, forms that, you know, are, are currently hopeless at the moment. But there's a big program um, that I and other people are working on, which is to really understand the relationship between these discrete random surfaces and this continuum object, Louisville quantum gravity. <coughs> okay, so um. So now, how do we define this Louisville quantum gravity? First of all, I, I want to say e to the quantum Gaussian free field times Lebesgue measure, or times the flat metric. But this takes some thought, because h is a distribution, not a function. Um, so this doesn't really actually make sense as it's written. But you can make sense in a certain limiting way. So take h epsilon to be z to be the mean value of h on the circle of radius epsilon. It turns out that that's well defined, even though the value of h at a point is not well defined. It's actually an almost surely polar continuous function. So I can define e to the gamma h epsilon of z. And I'd like to say the limit, so I can define m epsilon to be the random surface that I get by taking this as the lambda over here. So that gives me a random manifold. And I want to say that the limit of these manifolds is now another manifold m. OK, but what does that mean, that these manifolds converge to this manifold? Uh, well. You know, so I've got, uh, you know, we've got Jean-François Legault here in the audience who likes to think about these manifolds as metric spaces. Okay, but that's, so you could try to say, um, think of M as being a, a random metric space and try to show that these converge as metric spaces, maybe in the gromov hausdorff sense. Okay, but that's not what we do here. Here we're sort of, um, in this story, we're, we're, we're interested in the uh, conformal structure. Uh, more than the metric space structure. So what we would say is um, uh, let's try to understand maybe the measure of this. So, so here we've got some random measure on this field M. Let's pull it back and get a, a measure here, and let's try to understand what that measure on D looks like, sort of the pullback of the area measure up here. And you can show that um, almost surely as epsilon goes to zero, these measures converge to a non-trivial limiting measure mu. And so what we get is d together with a measure on it. And actually, similarly, you can make sense of the measure of smooth curves. You can make sense of the length of the boundary of the domain d. And you know, in various ways, you understand this thing as a, you know, quote, manifold, unquote. Well, you know, I don't know. I got this field of geometries. What structure you like to have in, a, in your non-smooth manifolds. But, um, this is a, a wildly fractal manifold. It's not a, a differentiable manifold in any conventional sense. But, um, <coughs> but I nonetheless, you know, I, I have a sense of length of curves. I have a sense of areas of sets that I draw here in D. I have a conformal structure. I can do a Brownian motion here. Um, you know, so I, I have a lot of the structure that, that one has with a, um, uh, with a manifold. Um, here's a picture of uh, a grid. Okay, this is, uh, this is what I get when I take gamma equal to zero. So I take e to the gamma, h epsilon of z. If gamma is zero, then uh, this is just one, and I just get dx squared plus y squared. And here, I've, I've broken this into squares that all have the same area. They all look the same. Here, I broke it up into squares that all have about the same area in my random metric. So I, I take this random manifold, I map it to D, I get this random metric down here. And what I'm doing with this random metric is I'm, or this random uh, measure, if you like, is I'm, I'm taking this grid and I divide it, I pick some delta, and I take this grid and I cut it into four pieces. I cut each of those squares into four pieces. I cut each of those squares into four pieces. And I continue until I get to a square whose area is less than delta. Okay. And then I stop dividing. So all of the squares here have area a little bit less than delta, in the sense that the area of this square is less than delta with the area of its dyadic parent, the set of you know, the twice larger square that I divided to get this square. The area of its dyadic parent is bigger than delta. So in some sense, all these squares have area order delta. They're less than delta, but their dyadic parent is bigger. 
So I've now tiled this with squares that are about the same size, about size delta in my random measure. Here's with a larger value of gamma. When gamma is larger, I have more fluctuations in the measure. Here's an even larger value of gamma. And you see, these are places where lambda is very big. I have a lot of measure here, because all these squares are about the same size in my random metric. And these are the places where it's, it's small. So I don't have very much. Lambda is small. And sort of the, I, the belief is that if you take a, um, a picture like this, one of these random quadrangulations, and you can formally map it to the plane or to a disk, you'll get something that, well, obviously the squares, the, the formal images of the squares won't be exactly squares. They'll be distorted in some way. But morally, they should still somehow look like this picture here, that you have some places where the squares get mapped to big squares, some places where they get mapped to small squares, and that in the scaling limit, you should get this same measure. And that's something that if anyone wants a, a, a famous, beautiful problem to, to work on, um, maybe with all these geometers here, we can bring a different perspective. This is mostly done by people on the probability side. Um, you know, maybe we can try to show, you know, how to prove that in the limit you actually get the, um, the same measure. OK. Um, so I want to mention briefly there's something called this KPZ formula, which says if I give you a fractal, maybe I take this, this random surface and I independently draw a random SLE curve on top of it. Um, and it's supposed to look like you know, one of those discrete paths that goes through some some set of squares. And um, I'd like to say, ask, how does the number of the size delta Euclidean squares hit by the fractal scale? Well, you know, typically it will scale like some power of delta related to the fractal dimension of the curve. And, um, and I would like to say that in the quantum case, the number of quantum squares will scale like some different power of delta. And um, so you know, basically, I draw a random curve here. Maybe the curve is just a straight line. And you know, here, I can tell you this straight line hits some number of squares. And that number of squares, if these are epsilon size squares, that number goes like epsilon to the minus 1. But here, you know, if these squares are all area delta, and I ask how many squares does this straight line hit, and I let delta get smaller, it should scale like some power of delta. And it turns out there's some relationship between the Euclidean dimension and the quantum one. And they're determined by this, this simple quadratic formula called the KPZ formula. And um, heuristically, at least, this quantum exponent describes what happens in these discrete models. And this was first derived by Kinesian Poyakov, Zamolochikov in 88. And from their point of view, it divided the, gave the first compelling evidence of a relationship between the discrete and continuous models. This is at least one Poyakov writes in his memoirs, that's when he became convinced that the discrete models had to, in some sense, converge to the continuum ones. Um, and so recently, we were able to prove the form of this I just described in terms of the, the squares. Uh, other form, just a joint work with Duplantier, who's also here. And, um, and there are other forms of KPZ using different forms of dimension. For example, there's a, a Rodas and Vargas, who are also here, have, have done a form of this using a, a, a variant of um, uh, of a quantum variant of Hausdorff dimension. Um, and uh, you know, the four of us got together and did a, a, a form of this for a, a critical version, another form of uh, this random measure. Um, but it's basically this, uh, you know, the, the story that KPZ envisioned in 98. We've kind of now uh, given a mathematical formulation of that story. Um, now, uh, OK, so let me. Say, if I could formally map this to a different domain, let me, let me skip this part. I want to say, there's a statement that if I give you two independent quantum surfaces, I could stitch them together along their boundaries in such a way that an area of length one here corresponds to an area of length one here. Or an er a, a part of length s here gets mapped to a something of length s here. So just in a length, an area, a length preserving way, I map this boundary to this boundary, one to one. And I identify these two manifolds and can formally map back to the half plane. So another theorem 
that I worked on was showing that if you could formally map these two things back to the half plane, this path becomes an SLE curve. So if you want more justification for, well, maybe you believe that SLE is, a, is the canonical random curve, but you're not sure that this is the canonical random surface. Or you believe these are the canonical random surfaces, but you're not sure SLE is the right notion of a canonical random curve. Well, you know, the fact that they're related to each other in this way should convince people who believe one of those two things to believe the other, perhaps. You know, you glue together two canonical random surfaces, you get a new surface, you can formally map that new surface to the plane, the interface becomes a canonical random path. You know, what could be simpler than that? Um, okay. And uh, also, there's an interesting phenomenon that if you take this path and you um, uh, say I, I mark off areas of the same length, so each, the region between a pair of dots have length one. And here these are length one regions of the boundary. Then I can imagine kind of zipping up. I, I identify these two dots, these two dots, these two dots, conformally map um, the new thing to a half plane. That sort of pulls these things up into the interior. I can think of that of zipping up, and I, or I can think of taking some scissors and cutting along this, conformally mapping back to the half plane. That's an unzipping process. And it turns out that this random pair, H with its independent SLE on it, is stationary with respect to the zipping and unzipping process. And, um, and surprisingly, in this, in, this, in this stationary version of the process, you know, the h and lambda are independent of each other. Um, so even though you know, I start here with an independent surface, these two surfaces are independent of each other. I map it down here, and I get a surface with a path. The path here is independent of the surface. Which means basically if I glue these together and then I take an eraser and I erase this boundary path, you can't tell where the boundary path was. You can't see it. Okay, so that's a kind of an amazing property of this particular type of random surface. Okay, and this is in, um, uh, here's a series of, of papers. I guess some of these are, are, are no longer just archive papers, right? So this is, I guess this, this is in Invenciones, this is in TRL, and this, this is still not, not published, and this is uh, in TRL. Okay, so now um, take an imaginary surface. So H is, what for imaginary surface, I take H to be some function. I take the vector field e to the i times H, and I can look at flow lines of this vector field. And I interpret this, a theta ray of this imaginary geometry will be a flow line of e to the i times this h plus theta. So basically, I can take all these angles and rotate them by theta, and then take the flow line of the new field, and that'll be uh, a flow line of angle theta. And I, I can do this for a range of angles, and I get this a range of flow lines starting from this point. And I view these as rays in this random geometry. And and this is what, you know, I'll consider these to be kind of rays in this imaginary surface. So it's, it's I, I have a notion of, um, of line, I have a notion of rays, and you, if you think about it with this notion of line, if I have three, uh, if I make a triangle, then the sum of the e angles will always be 180 degrees, will always be pi. So, um, and that's somehow because the, the real curvature is zero. So it has zero real curvature, it has only imaginary curvature. Um, but, but still, it's a natural thing to do. You know, e to the i times the field, add theta to it if you like, look at the, the kinds of ra rays you can get. And if I take h to be a small multiple of the free Gaussian free field, um, conformally mapped to a square, say, I get a region of rays that now have some randomness. And as the value of the field gets larger, the more random they get. And you can kind of see here that th these become fractal curves that turn out to be forms of these SLE curves. And, um, and you also see that there's some big gaps here. And so in the limit, when you take the gaps and fill, it turns out that there are regions here that, um, that are not hit by any curve starting from this point. And another way to think of it is that if you're in this imaginary geometry and you're a hunter standing at this point and you want to shoot a deer, if the deer is standing here, 
no matter how carefully you aim, you can't hit it. Okay, if you know if H were a smooth function, you could always hit it by tuning your it just right, but sort of in the limit as you get to the free field that these you actually develop these actual big gaps. So there there's some deal you, you simply cannot hit no matter how carefully you aim. Um, and so we call these things fans. Um, here's a set of uh, Basically, I'm done with my talk except for pictures. I'm about out of time. But let me run through just a few pictures. Um, here are all of the, uh, um, I, I start here at the boundary, and I, I draw all of the northwest going flow lines. And you see, if I draw a northwest going flow line here, northwest going flow line here, at some point, they actually merge into each other. And that doesn't actually happen if h is, is a smooth function. It may be that they get closer to each other as you go. You know, maybe they get exponentially close. But when you actually have a, a wild function like this, they actually at some point merge and hit each other. Um, here's the path going north. These are northwest. These are northeast. And you'll see that the red path always cr cross the green paths at right angles. Even though they merge where you have a crossing, it's always a right angle. Um, here I took a range of angles of paths starting at one point. Here's a range of angles starting at another point. And you see the way they merge. You know, if you take each, and, and the, the angle is indicated by color. So here, if you take the blue angle, you'll see at some point it will go over here, find its soulmate, and then merge. So each color comes over, finds its partner, merges with it, and then stays with that partner forever after. Um, so, uh, so basically, the, the method of defining these things from the Gaussian free field, this um, uh, this work by me, but work joint with Schramm, a work of Dubeda, a work of uh, Israel Kiola. They, they did some other uh, work on this, this subject. Um, uh, Dubeda, who, who's also here, um, uh, showed that this, this field determines uh, the path. If you, um, if you know H, that uniquely determines um, gamma. So you can really think of these, these paths as being functions of the field. If you know the field, then you, um, you actually know uh, these paths. And, um, and in a recent four-paper series with, with Miller, and this is a very long work, this is 450 pages of um, a lot of different uh, topics, we really explored these random geometries in great detail. We prove a lot of theorems in SLE uh, using them, and we have all kinds of pictures. Um, so here's a picture that kind of illustrates uh, a way you can actually use these flow lines to build SLE kappas for kappa bigger than 8, bigger than 4, um, by in taking flow lines that, whose angles vary in certain ways. Here's a picture that shows how you can make a sort of Van Gogh-esque presentation by, um, by taking points and drawing. These are flow lines going, basically, the, the, these uh, kind of flows that you can see here represent flow lines uh, of a certain um, imaginary geometry. And, uh, and the curve is a certain form of SLE. It's SLE 128. Um, and uh, this is an SLE 32, 32. You, you really get nice. Jason did these pictures, by the way. He's the artist. One of them actually won an art competition at MSRI. It's hanging up there. So I think uh, so. my collaborator is, is both a great mathematician and a, a really great artist. Um, here is a, uh, this is the, the fan. Um, it's a set of all points you can hit by flow lines here, together with uh, this, um, I guess what we call this light cone, this, this, this other structure. And, um, and we were able to prove, using all these results, for example, the fact that SLE from x to y is the same in law as XLE from y to x. So that's, you know, the curve this way is the same as the curve this way. It's something we proved. This was one of Oded Schramm's problems. Um, and so Jean had proved it for four, Dubida and Jean for a variance. So we extended this to, um, to all uh, row values using these um, SLE techniques. Uh, oh, this in particular applies, for example, that these SLE loops, these CLE kappa loops are well defined uh, for the full range of kappa for which they should be defined. Um, we, uh, yeah. We, we obtained reversibility of these SLE paths. 
there are more pictures. Okay, and uh, more references. This is the four paper series I promised for you. It's called Imaginary Geometry 1, 2, 3, and 4. Um, between the uh, papers, there are actually several hundred pictures or, or figures. So, you know, you're welcome to go online just, just for the artwork, if you like. And uh, that's it for today.